try to distract what you're actually doing instead of what you could be doing. So right now, I just thank you, Father, for this time as we hear your word, God. Your word is the authority. Your word is life. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, you just come and breathe life on that which cuts other men and, 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 and condemns other men, God. It comes to bring us life as children. We know, God, and we are not a ashamed or afraid of correction from you, God, because we know you have our best interest. So therefore, Lord, we can just open arms, run into your arms, jump on your lap and say, God, whatever it is about me, God, I want to know. I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what you see in me. I know that you see these great things, God, but I'm not afraid of the things you want to transform in me. I'm not afraid of the tough things conversations with you because I know like Pastor Tracy was talking about I know how you bring life even to things that may hurt and I thank you God for these this revelation that comes only by the spirit of the living God I pray that each word that I speak will find its mark on good ground for we are good ground we have new hearts we've been given new lives new names God in you in Christ Jesus we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to jump in. Um, I do want to say that we have uh, this Love After Marriage book. The Sean Bowles book is called The Non-Religious Guide to Dating and Being Single. So that's a really awesome. You, we'll, we'll actually have a couple of the people that are speaking over the classes share a couple points in the uh, next service or two. Um, we're going to take the this Tuesday... We're, we're going to do some something really awesome. But the Tuesday following, we're going to have a whole Testimony Tuesday from what happens in the conference. So we're just going to take, uh, we're going to collect, we're going to find out what God's doing, and we're going to just showcase God's goodness. Um, you know, the prophetic is so powerful. I, in fact, I was amazed. I was telling people last night about, we were just having conversation. I started talking about the prophetic conference and uh, the equipping of the saints and, and how prophetic works. And they looked at me like a cow at a new gate. And I was like, like that, that, that doesn't make sense to you? These are like Christians, like hungry for Jesus. Some of them were prayer warriors. They had no idea about the prophetic. They had no idea what was available to them. See, as the, as the fivefold ministry, we're supposed to equip saints to do the work of the ministry. We're not supposed to show people that we're awesome. <laughs> the fivefold ministry isn't to feel awesome about yourself. H Hello, I, I know I came from a church where everybody was awesome about themselves. In fact, they would open their wallet and be like, yes, I'm evangelist so-and-so. My card says so. Uh, then another person had prophet cards and, you know, there were some apostle cards going around, pastor cards. And faith. We even have deacon cards. Deacons had cards. And it's no, no problem to know who you are, but when that's your identity... That's a problem. Your identity is, is, is like a son of God who gets to equip saints through a mechanism called a calling or an office. And in the office, I get to raise up people that get to be amazing. But what happens is sometimes we're so lacking in our identity as orphans that we want to be somebody that we're trying to find identity in anything that works. So I want you guys to realize that as we continue in this vein, I am very intentional about making sure that you identify with Christ Jesus and not a calling, not an office, not a gifting. There's no gift that's worth taking the place of your sonship. Hear me. You are loved by God and nothing is better than that. Nothing is better than knowing that God himself sent his son to take your place and die as you so you could live as him. Nothing can take that place, and I just want to say that because we can get really excited about things that are exciting, but they're not even worthy to compare to the reality that I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and I have access to the Father who created all things. See, if I have that, if I, the fact that you can know things, the fact that you can see things, the fact that you can have people's names, that you can get their address. Who cares? You're seated with Jesus. Who cares if you can get somebody's bank number? I mean, be careful. Like, 
I got a routing number here from somebody, uh, social security number, date of birth. Hey, this works really good on the black market. <laughs> Just being stupid, sorry. All right, so let's jump in. So we're going to be doing love after marriage. And um, I have some bullets here, but I'm not going to share them right now. But um, our marriages need to be protected and they need to be really, really understood that, look, my wife and I were just like going through like all this conversation that I got to do at like two in the morning last night was all about, was all about reconnecting when you get, when you get busy and life takes over and you can pretend like, like I know pe how people think about our marriage, but the reality is we have the same struggles as everybody else. And I don't like to deify positions, and I don't like to say, like, we have such an awesome marriage. I'm not trying to present some facade. We have an awesome marriage, but we have some serious, intense fellowship that makes the marriage more awesome when I figure out how to get humble, how to get it right, how to get back on track, how to get my head back in the game, how to get love on purpose, how to get love first, how to crucify myself. And those things are not glorious. Hello, somebody. Oh, y'all are sanctified. Praise the Lord. All right, I got it. I got like three marriages that are like, eight, some are like, hey, man, just kind of undercover. But that's cool. Because here's the thing. I, wanted, I want you to know I have a good marriage because I'm willing to fight for it. I don't have a good marriage because it's rosy. My wife is amazing, but me, whew, Jesus, help. I mean, my wife says some things I said, like, she says, she says, you think of me this way. I said, you're like 90% amazing. You just don't like when I talk about 10%. <laughs> like, we don't like to talk about our sore places. That's why they're sore. But if you cut it open and let it get out, we can get on with this program that God has for us. Amen? So. I don't think I got quite 90% awesome. She did not reflect my awesomeness. In fact, I think my awesomeness was way less. It was quite inferior, yes. But she did not give me any stats on my awesomeness. So I think it must be pretty dismal. But, you know, hey. I, uh, I love Jesus. <laughs> so let's move into this, right? We're going to jump. So everybody say this. This is uh, the topic today. I'm jumping in. My super state. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is there's a funny thing going around, and I think it's quite interesting that the world is interested in all this stuff that the church is really scared of, but the world is getting really excited about supernatural events. In fact, uh, movies that are supernatural, rather they're demonic or rather they're um, superpowers or whatever, they're just becoming such a blockbuster and such a huge market to a people that are interested in supernatural and then we try to minister to them with a bunch of dry stuff that doesn't minister and cater to the fact that there's something else out there there's something more there's something greater and if we don't start being comfortable with supernatural things we're going to take people to, where are we going to take people that are interested questions people have we need to get past that so we're going to start and it's interesting, we had so much conversation, uh, I just call it conversation, it was worship around idols. There was a man in, in the book of Judges, chapter 6. As you turn there, I know it would be on the screen, but you can turn and read for yourself. We're going to talk about Gideon for a minute. Gideon's dad was an idol maker too. In fact, he was like the chief, like he built the Baal altars. How, would, how cool would it be like, yeah... My dad's the Baal wor worship builder. He builds all the Baal churches. And then God comes to you and says, hey, guess what? I want to use you. And you're like, anyway, it's good to hear Gideon's response. We'll read it for ourselves. But can you imagine? Some of us think that God is interested in your qualifications. When God doesn't <laughs> call the qualified, he qualifies those that he calls. He doesn't sit there and say like, wow, this guy is so impressive, I should use him. No, he knows that your resume is going to get in his way. In fact, he'll call you to something you're so unqualified for that you're like, 
you know, a fish out of water. You were like, if you would have just put me in water, I would have had this thing down. I would have known what I was doing. I would have had it all together. But instead you take me and you call me a fish. Now you want me to fly. You put a bird in the, underneath the water. And you try to do these weird things. The reason, the reason why I say that is because we're all trying to get to a place of comfort in the natural Instead of realizing that God wants you to be so uncomfortable that you're constantly inquiring. <laughs> God wants you to be so uncomfortable that you're constantly in relationship. How is this going to work? See, that's why I don't like superstar Christians. Because we don't actually show you what's going on behind the scenes. We put up like, oh, praise the Lord, I, I, I believe you, brother. And we say, like, like, we got this thing figured out. Listen, we're all trying to figure out the same things but the more we're able to realize that we're just we we're just learning by stepping out and what we want to do is instead of uh showcasing ourselves we want to showcase what is available to all of us and i believe that this whole prophetic conference is around that i believe that the prophetic is so powerful that saul looking for donkeys ends up finding a new heart he, actually, it says this, he became a new man. You could be on your comedy show thinking you just need a laugh, but you find yourself becoming a new man. Because what happens is when you get around the Spirit of the Lord, when the Spirit of the Lord hovers with the saints, see, people think they come to church so they can check their check boxes. You are supposed to come to church to be empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. Like, there's a supernatural empowering. When we come together, we're actually, whether you even know it or not, it has nothing to do with you knowing, with you being aware. That just helps. Because then you have more faith to step into it, right? You have faith to step into things that you know you're receiving. Where you might just realize, wow, I just, I just grew like a foot in the last couple months. We see that in people's life. Like, they're like, they're like tracking, trending a certain way, and all of a sudden, they just get really excited about Jesus, and all of a sudden, they just launch. And you're like, whoa, look at that. That's so awesome. And see, I get excited about that. There's a lot of things to get excited about in life, but I'm most excited about people in their development, of, just, especially in, like, launch stages. You know, I know sometimes there's these, like, plateaus, and we grow slow in certain phases, but when you see somebody launch, it just does a papa's heart real good. And so I'm like, oh, look, growth spurts, and you just took off. Look at you. And um, so this is why we really need to make sure that we're constantly bringing in new lives to be able to be transformed because what God wants to do is so far beyond inside the walls. He wants to do something way farther than what's inside the walls. So you have to know what's inside the walls and what it's for. This isn't to make you feel good. You should come in already accepted. And if you're not accepted, get accepted today. Uh, Jeremy said one line. That was, that was off. But it was, it was cool because it actually exposes our things. He said God, uh, God he said something about God, uh, something about God being, uh, you, we, we do something and, and you're getting satisfied. When God is so fully satisfied with you, you can't add to it. Just like your baby, you don't sit there and go like, oh, if you would just, I, I really need you to get on the ball. I had our, 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 our littlest grandbaby, and the week before I had our other grandbaby, and we've, we've had uh, two weeks of family time. And in that time, I realized more and more how Father God looks at his children. You know, it. It brings joy to dad's heart when kids do good things, but it doesn't satisfy. Dad is satisfied in relationship. Dad's not satisfied in uh, accomplishments. Dad's glorified in accomplishments. Dad is satisfied in relationship. Dad is satisfied with you all together, and there's nothing you can do about it. Like when, you're, when, you're, when your merits are low and when you bring home the flunking report card, dad is not less satisfied with you. Dad is just not glorified in you. Dad is still completely dad. Father is still completely father. And in relationship, he's still completely in love with you. 
In fact, he's going to go the extra mile to make sure that you have everything it takes to glorify him. He's going to go out of his way to put the right people in your life. And so it's important that you become the right people in people's life. See, a lot of times we're trying to receive instead of realizing we're the answer to somebody's problem that creates the answer to our problem. They don't. But when I give, it's given back to me. When, when, when I become the solution to the people around me, the world's hurts around me, the things people are going through, I realize, wow, the answers in my own uh, relationship with God, and as I share God's goodness, it becomes apparent to me. It's amazing. All right, Gideon chapter 6, here we go. Gideon, uh, Judges chapter 6, Gideon's in there somewhere. All right, Judges chapter 6, 11, verse 11. And it came to pass, an angel of the Lord sat under the oak, what was an Orpha, that pertained to Joash, the Abazarite. And the son of Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress and hid it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord. Just like that. Oh, my Lord. More like that. If the Lord be with us, why has this befallen us? And where be all the miracles that our father told us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord has looked on him and said, go this in your might. And you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, O oh my Lord, with which shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites. <laughs> this is so awesome. Like, I can't eat. Like, think about this conversation of our excuses and how our, my my position and how my inventory and how everything's disqualified me and how is this going to happen what you're saying is impossible and God I want you to know doesn't even bother with all your excuses but goes right into the midst of what the issue is if I'm with you you'll have no problems come on somebody I'm about to wake this place up. I feel the fire of God. Because the reality is we have to stop looking at our inventory and how good we've been and our report card and all the stuff that makes us actually God instead of Him. God is not interested in us getting in His way. He's interested in our obedience. Our obedience brings us into a place. Okay, God, I don't know how this is going to happen. He says, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. Now, now, when God says things to us, we get a little cynical sometimes when they're too grand. When they're big things that God says to us, sometimes we have to like bring them down to our level by, uh, by belittling ourselves to make ourselves feel like, like, what did he say? I, I don't know. Have you been really taking inventory of my family? Like, my dad's the uh, idol builder. Uh... Moab is taking all of our stuff, or Moabites, they're coming in and taking everything we have, everything that belongs to us, and some of you guys might feel like that toward, you call them creditors, but the reality is, you say, where is the God of these miracles? Where is the God of the guy Pastor George keeps talking about? Where is this guy that's supposed to bring deliverance to my finances? Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. You don't have to worry about your inventory. You have to worry about whether God is with you. <laughs> the inventory is not important. In fact, what happened is he looks at his enemies. He looks at his inventory. What happens? His, his enemies tell him to hide his inventory. His, en his enemies are keep on, keep on coming at him. I just realized, like, I, did, I just said something prophetic. I just have to dig in for a second. Um, his enemies cause him to hide. He was hiding, and when he's supposed to be threshing wheat, he's down in a wine press. Threshing is best done in the open. 
If y'all don't, yeah, I, I'm looking at faces. Y'all don't even know what threshing is. Okay, that's cool. Threshing, threshing means that I'm, I'm like, I'm like pounding wheat against rocks and I'm letting it fly. What's wrong? It's called chaff, right? Chaff is flying everywhere. Like we don't like to do that stuff, do we? Like open air counseling. <laughs> chaff is flying, buddy. And you know what? It, it attracts things when chaff's flying. Hey, there's some things going on over here. In fact, they even celebrate with a little bonfire. It was their early day fireworks. Did you guys know that? Chaff makes great fireworks. You light that stuff on fire, it's like early days TNT, you know. Boo. So God wants to you to take what you're trying to hide and bring it way more in the open. Now I'm not talking to, like, like first of all, we have to learn who's Lord in our life. Uh, somebody actually quoted this. I thought it was the best definition I ever heard about idols. He said, an idol is something that you go to to get comfort. Idol can be relationships. Idol can be your marriage. Idol can be your children. If you don't know how to go to the Lord, your spouse, your significant other, your children, you know, your pastor, they cannot satisfy. They cannot bring comfort. Not true comfort. They can bandage you. They can kiss your boo-boo, but they will not satisfy you. See, and when we go to try to get satisfaction from something, and we keep pulling from something that wasn't meant to satisfy, guess what? You're going to get tired of what your results are. You get tired of what the best, see, the best I can give you is not going to satisfy you. The best I can give you. I can help for a while. But if I don't get you to Jesus, guess what? I'm not going to be good enough. I'm aware of that, and I'm okay with that. Because I was really not trying to get you to me anyway. I was trying to get you to Jesus. And so sometimes that's not okay with people. They want me to be super pastor. I'm just not. I'm terrible at it, actually. I, I'm, 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 really, I'm really interested much more in Jesus and those that want to run after Jesus than I am at your pain and what you've been through. Your pain and what you've been through are devastating. But they should compel you, and one day they will, that there's something better than my pain. There's something more alive than what I've been through. In fact, what you've been through is all about what you can testify to when you get on through to the other side. In fact, while I'm on this topic, I might as well talk about testimonies for a second. By the way, I felt like the Lord was saying this to me this week. Testimonies are not, they're, they're prophetic in nature, right? The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. What we need to be careful is to stop telling our testimony and start telling his testimony. In other words, it's not about what you've done, it's about what he's done. You can tell what you've done, but you, what you've done actually is not the real part of the testimony. The testimony is what has he done. See, you need to learn to... Uh, relate with the people you're talking to and not it being about you. I, I've heard, see, I've been through testimony stuff forever, ever and ever and ever. And sometimes even testimony becomes a one-up competition. And you're like, okay, well, let's, let's get Jesus on the one-upper. Like, let's put Jesus on the object of the testimony instead of how much I've smoked and how much I've done and how much, you know, all that stuff is irrelevant. Because ultimately, it's about he found me while I was at war with him. He found me while I was in anarchy. He found me while I was agnostic and atheist and all that stuff. He found me be just because life got the best of me. And I said, there's got to be more than this. And God said, yeah, you want to know? You want to know? Because all you have to do is ask one question. And God is ignited. Are you there? Guess what? Oh, your eyes, scales are going to come off your eyes the day you ask that question. And sometimes I ask that question still. Because there's a new place that God has you that's not going to have the same answers that you, used, that you heard last time. Yesterday's solutions won't solve today's problems. 
Sometimes we keep repeating the same things, trying to get the new results. But the, new, the place you are today was based on yesterday's solutions. I'm inviting you to something different. This relationship with Jesus is everything. It's everything. Listen to this. I'm, I, I don't know who you're talking to, Lord, but I am hiding my wheat in a wine press where there's no wind and it's secretive. And I'm hoping they won't find out that I got some grain down here. Now, what I said prophetic, in case you didn't catch it, I, I sense you caught it, but is that the, when you take the, um, when you take the, what the enemy's doing and it causes you to hide, guess what the enemy knows? Keep the pressure on. They won't go anywhere. If you cower, oh man, I feel Pastor George, he, he quoted the scripture, I quoted it now once. If you cower in the day of adversity, your strength is small. When bullets are flying, you need to learn to rise up above them because you can't be taken down. Like, not because you're so awesome. We get that. We get that totally. I totally get that. I hope you get it. It's like, I know I'm not awesome. I actually am very unimpressed with myself. But Jesus, on the other hand, oh, my friends, Jesus is amazing. And he makes me supernaturally alive. And so today is all about what is superimposing on you? You know, uh, you guys heard about impartation. Impartation. Randy Clark talks about it a lot. We're going to be doing some impartation this week coming up in the prophetic. We're going to be doing tons of activation. And you're going to find out that you're way more prophetic than you ever thought you were. And the most important thing is when, when you get something new, you have to learn. Uh, like, it's kind of like you're, the Bible talks about expanding your tent pegs. You ever heard that scripture? It talks about expanding what God's doing in your life. And what you do when you expand is you have to fortify. So, um, so when somebody prays for you and there's new grace that comes to you, you have to learn to fortify or build up retainers that will keep you in that new place. And the reason why I know that is because when I got hit by, by the, uh, the movement in Brownsville for like a few weeks, I went from being like a drug addict the week before to like laying hands on people and they're falling on the floor shaking. In one week. Obviously, I didn't get that somewhere by deep prayer and fasting and intercession. I didn't even know about that stuff. What happened is I wasn't ready for the foretaste I was receiving. You hear me? An impartation is kind of like, uh, I like to call it transient. It's a little bit electrical. But uh, if you're with me for a second. It's, a, it's, a, it's, like, it's like a jump start. To who you are, and it shows you a future of what you're to become. And so you have to decide, do you want to become that today, or would you rather wait a couple years? Maybe 40. I've waited 20. I've waited 20 for some of the things that I have foresaw because of, a, because of an impartation. And so today I believe that the Lord is, is taking away the enemy's ability to fear you back into a corner and fear you back into uh, hiding underground what your substance is. Instead, you're going to be proud of what the substance is and you're going to be okay with being in the open. You're going to be okay with uh, letting your light shine and you're not going to hide it under a bushel basket. Why did Jesus talk about hiding your light under a bushel basket if that doesn't even make sense? Like, who does that? He's kind of actually not saying who does that. He's saying why? Are we doing that? Yeah, he wouldn't ask the question if he was like, nobody does that. He's saying, people are doing this. Why? Why do you let the light that shine not shine where you are? You know, people agree with their darkness, but they won't take off the lampshade. Like you're in a workplace, you're at a supermarket, you're in the world, and you're like, it's so dark out here. If you just take the lampshade off, that wouldn't even be true anymore. Or the bushel basket. I don't know. That's a weird lampshade, but it must be the. So you got this lampshade and you take this thing off and light begins to penetrate the darkness. Light is so superior that you'll begin to transform the atmosphere. And then you'll learn why you need to stop threshing your wheat in the wine press. You're on the top of a hill just beating that grain to like where you're getting the fullness of what is in you. 
And you're not worried about the chaff that's flying and what people might say. And they say like uh, David comes to give his brother sandwiches and they say, oh, we know your arrogance. We know the pride that's in your heart. Look, keep on, keep on, uh, just, just keep on threshing. Because you know what? They might not understand you today. People might not understand what you have because they haven't seen the process that's taking place. Because they see, they see you just threshing right now, but they don't see what you're threshing toward. They don't see the bread that's going to be coming out of your life. They don't see the manifest of ki- the kingdom of God. And so they won't understand. And you know what the worst thing you could do? Is put back on the bushel basket. Try to cower. Try to be humble. Humble is not putting yourself down. Humble is exalting Jesus. Like, we have to stop putting ourselves down thinking it's exalting. How much would your parents like it if you were next to them? And uh, somebody said, wow, you're so amazing. Um, And you say, like, no, I'm an idiot. Like, you just won the spelling bee. It's random. I'm not good at spelling, so much better these days. But if you go like, no, I'm an idiot, and your dad is sitting right next to you, like one of the proudest moments of his life. Look how good my son did in this race or in this in this amazing thing. And then the kid's like, no, I'm, I'm not really that good. You just won the race. Come on. Dad's like rejoicing. He looks at you. And you're like, no, I'm nobody. You're my son. What do you mean you're nobody? You're my daughter. You, what do you mean you're nobody? You deserve the best. Amen. You deserve the best. You think that stuff, I'm not, I'm not hyping you. This is the Father's thoughts towards you. If there's anything I don't like, it's, I don't like hype. I don't like hype at all. Because hype just gives you emotions. You need to get a revelation. You need to get a revelation of God's love for you. That His love is so awesome towards you. See, that's why it says faith comes through love. Because once you know how much he loves you, you know how he's going to move mountains on your behalf. He's going to move mountains on your behalf, Preston. So so Gideon, Gideon gets to a place where he's like, this is crazy. I don't know what's going on. I feel like, I, you know, my dad's, my dad's warped. He's making idols for the enemy. He's making altars for the wrong team. And uh, he says, well, this is all you need to know. The Lord said to him, surely I'm with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. And so Gideon gives an offering. The offering is consumed by the angel. He has an encounter with his angel, realizes how, how real this is. He destroys the altars that his father built. Then he uh, does the, even though he knows all this stuff, he still does the fleece. Come on, any fleecers out there? Oh, yeah, there's some fleecers in here. Fleecers are like, this is a whole thing like you're questioning God and people say you shouldn't question God. God is totally okay with questions. In fact, he invites questions because questions mean you care. Questions mean you want to know. Don't question him to be God. Question him rather you can. That's fine. Question our abilities. Don't question his. The difference between Mary and uh, Zechariah, thank you. Zechariah is asking God if he can even do it. Mary's asking God, how can it happen? I'm a virgin. They're both questioning. Zechariah ends up being mute until his son's born so he can say the name of his son, John the Baptist. Mary is blessed by the encounter and has a son, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, or Yeshua. I found it funny that it took a long time, but people didn't even know what the word Yeshua means. Like, you know, God, uh, Jehovah Sid Canoe, our righteousness. Jehovah Nisi, my banner. You got Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Rofa, my healer. You got all these names of God, and then you have this other one that people don't know. Yeshua, the Lord, my salvation. Salvation is more than you going to heaven. Salvation is you becoming who Christ is. Salvation is you living out 
the life that Christ gave to you. It's not about you making it to heaven. You were made to walk out the steps of the Messiah in the earth. He's the head of the body. And you're meant to walk out the steps which the head took your place that you could wa- finish the race. So, um, as we get ready to wrap up, I, I got a little bit carried away. <laughs> but but here's, here's some things I want you to hear. Okay? God said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, God said, let light shine out of darkness, and he made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You hear that? I'll say it again. Let the light shine out of darkness. See, it's okay if part of you doesn't agree with the rest of you. The part that got you here today is the part that needs to start shining and making testimony to the rest of to the rest of the, the you that don't know who it is yet. You say, how can that be? I don't, read Romans 7 if you need some help. That's the guy that don't know who he is. He's, he's betwixt. I want to do good things, but I don't do good things, and I feel so bad about what I'm doing. I don't know why. It's, oh, wretched man am I. This is Apostle Paul talking like a maniac. Then finally he's like, there's therefore now no condemnation. To those that are in Christ Jesus. Because he realizes he, whenever he serves the flesh, the flesh brings death. Whenever I serve the spirit, I have life. I have peace. I have satisfaction. I have everything I was here for in the first place. Now the funny thing is church doesn't make you live after God. Hello? You come to church and you might get that like, woo, ah, I'm alive. And you might go for it. You might run after it. But at the end of the day, it has to take root. I could put gas on a rock all day long. That rock will blaze. But guess what? The moment I stop putting gas on it, it's going to die out. It'll be hot for a little while. It might even glow. But guess what? It's still going to be a rock when it's done. You need to learn how to take your heart and put it in the fire. You need to learn how to take your being and put it in the fire that's here. Because if you don't bring your life into the transformation, transforming power of the Holy Spirit, you'll just live it out and then you'll wonder, well, what happened? And then you've got to blame somebody because it's terrible to blame yourself. It's terrible to take responsibility. You know, it's definitely the woman he gave me. That's the easy way out, right? It's the woman you gave me. Oh, it's the serpent. And all of us are trying to find out whose fault it is instead of how can I get more logs on this fire? How can I make this last? So, so it says, the next verse says, um, so he let, oh, let me just read that quote one more time. Let light shine out of darkness, and he made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, now we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that this surpassing great power from God is not of us. And so we have a treasure that's on the inside of us, the light that's on the inside of us. And that's actually the whole thing we should be completely consumed about. The temple having the light. The temple, we're all temples of the Holy Spirit. We're all temples of the Holy Spirit. And so as we close today, um, I want you to hear this. Because God isn't after your play toys. God isn't after your favorite toys. He's not after your favorite idols. He's not interested in all those. If those are the gods you love, he wants you to have them. Because at the end of the day, you're going to find out they're dumb. Dumb idols. That's what the Bible calls them. I wasn't saying... I wasn't saying you have dumb idols, but it could be true. Um, I'm saying that idols don't bring life. You know, you can watch you can watch uh, 24 episodes of whatever show series and then like not sleep for three days. But guess what? Afterwards, you're not going to feel full of life, even though you'll know all the stuff that ever happened in that episodes. You're going to feel like drained. You're going to feel like, why did I do that? Why did I waste my time? And you're going to feel emptier because you gave it to an idol. And God wants you to figure out 
Life is all about who you serve. Life is all about who is on the throne of your heart. So if you want something, God is all about stepping aside and letting you have at it. I could prove it in the prodigal son. I mean, who, dad, dad, can I just have my inheritance that falls on me? Like, before you're even dead, let's pretend like you're dead. And if you're dead, like, can I have the half that falls to me? And dad says, that's a great idea, son. I want you to have your half of the inheritance, and I want you to just go do what I know you're going to do with it. What dad does that? The dad that wants you to discover that life isn't life without dad. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Dad wants you to know him in such a way that you find out that nothing else is going to satisfy you. You could think you're missing a relationship. I need a significant other. I need somebody else to make me whole. That other person that you think is making you whole is one day going to be the bane of your existence. Because guess what? Only Hallmark says two halves make a whole. In the kingdom of God, two halves multiply and you get a quarter. <laughs> Hello? That's how it works. Half in the kingdom it multiplies. Half times half. All my mathematicians, come on. Stan, help me out. It's a quarter. Okay? The less whole you are, the less you're going to bring into a relationship. If you don't know how to be single, even though you're married, you'll be single sometimes. You'll feel alone sometimes. You'll feel like, oh, I don't get what I want. Guess what? <laughs> that was the worst reality check I ever had. What? I don't get what I want now that I'm married? I'm not going to tell. We'll have to wait for the marriage class. Pastor Elder Roy, you're going to have to help us with that. Uh, tell us what we're talking about here so, before I get myself in trouble. So, it's a bailout. So, and this is the last, last thing I want to share. I'll go into these in the afternoon, but I have a, a bunch of scriptures still um, talking about the super state and, and how familiarity uh, comes against it. But I do want to read one more scripture. Come on, all y'all stand to your feet, please. I'm going to read this over you. Mm. Thank you, Lord. How many people want to talk like their father? Talk like, talk like Father God. You want to talk like Jesus talked. Well, here's a really amazing uh, scripture out of Romans 4, 7. It says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Before whom, before him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which be not as though they are. And so ultimately, God is looking at Gideon, calling Gideon what he knows him to be, even though right now it don't look like it's possible. And some of us really need to understand the difference of having God speaking over our lives and the difference of having our earthly perspective. Your earthly perspective is like putting a lampshade right on what God's given you. And what we need to do is say, God, you see things that I don't see yet. And I want you to know that what you see, I need to, I need you to open up. I need you to open up my heart. I need you to open up my reality. So, Father, right now, I just thank you for all the mighty men and women of valor in this place. We just decree and declare, Father, for them to crush every idol, God, destroy every altar, even if it was their family's altar. We say there's no place like being with you, God. We say there's no place and there's no excuses, God, that can hold us back another day. There's no generational curses. I'm walking in the generational blessings of Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, we can raise up and become who you've called us to be. We can walk in the fullness of God. We can walk in wholeness in everything that we have, God. And I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that every man and woman and child in this ministry will step into the fullness of who you've called us to be. You have called us to be sons and daughters of the living God. And we just break off the need for identity in any other place. We break off the need for identity in any other place. In the name of Jesus right now. Now, I know there's, there's identity crises in the world. I know there, 
What you doing with that music? Jeremy, jump up there real quick. Just, just turn the keys number ch channel five on. I was like, what is that music? So if I was wondering, y'all were probably going. Hmm. Hallelujah. Victory is good. So we thank you, Lord, for victory in Jesus. And we just break off every other idol, God. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for fullness. I thank you, Lord, for all those that you're going to impact this week. I thank you, Lord, for all those that you're going to stir up the gift of God is, that's on the inside. I thank you, Lord, for all the speakers that are coming. And I thank you, Lord, that you're just going to you're just going to uh, speak right to areas of people's life. To show them not only have you been listening, but you're quite aware. There's going to be healings, deliverances, signs and wonders, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And now to every person in this place. That you've let the enemy crush your self-esteem. You've let the enemy cause you to go into hiding. I'm going to have you come up here with all the prayer warriors. We're going to pray over you. And we're going to speak what God speaks over you. We're going to speak things which be not as though they are. Because God knows where you're at. And I want you to hear today the beautiful voice of your Father. That says you don't have to go into a place of earning anymore. It's time for you to walk in a place of being. And Father, I thank you, Lord. We just open this altar right now in Jesus' name. And we declare it's sanctified. We declare this is the place where, Lord, you meet your people. And it's not by our prayers. It's not by our eloquent words. But it's by the act of coming up that we say, God, I'm ready to come out from hiding. I'm ready to take over the mountain of the Lord. Come on, I want you to jump out of your seats if that's you. You know what I'm talking about. If you've been ashamed of uh, releasing him because you were worried about what people would see, I want you to hear me today. God is going to touch your life. If you're on the intercessory prayer team, I want you to get up here and help me out. We're going to pray. And Father, I thank you, Lord, right now for every person that's stepping up into this altar because they're saying yes to you. Come on, they're casting down their fa father's idols right now. In the name of Jesus, come on, we just decree and declare, Lord, open up the eyes and the ears. Father, I thank you for the supernatural taking over in the name of Jesus. If I can get a couple catchers, thank you, Jesus. We just come in your presence right now. We thank you for grace. Thank you for grace right now in Jesus' name. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Right now, in Jesus' name. All he has. All he has. All he has. Mm. Superimpose. The supernatural, Father. We know why he's here. He knows why he's here. Roshata Rabati. Father, we thank you. Supernatural life now infused right now the fire of God. Yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Fill, be filled with the glory, be filled with the glory. Yes, Lord, in Jesus' name. More Lord. More Lord. More Lord. Did it in your life? Now. 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 In the name of Jesus. More. More Lord. Thank you, Lord, for fresh hunger. Thank you for fresh hunger, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for fresh hunger right now. In the name of Jesus. Fresh fire. Yeah, yeah. We thank you for your gift. Yeah. More of you, Jesus. 
Oh, the fire on the inside. The fire on the inside, God. Come on, we call forth the light everywhere she goes. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your son, Lord. I just thank you, Lord. Have your way. Just bless your son right now. Supernatural realities open up. Open up supernatural realities right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the mind of Christ right now. Have your way. Have your way, Jesus. Father, be glorified in your Son. Let your will be done. Father, I thank you, Jesus, for knowing you like never before. More of you, Jesus. More of you, Jesus. Right now, fire of God. Right now, thank you, Lord, for your mind. Thank you for your mind. Thank you for your mind. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Uh -huh.